pleasure to welcome you to our church online here at Hamilton Baptist. Good morning, friends. Uh, it's fantastic to welcome you again to our online service here at Hamilton Baptist. And a special warm welcome to you if you're joining us for the first time. It's great that we can gather again in this way, uh, remotely, but gather together in one spirit. Uh, I'm going to do things a little different this morning. Uh, I'm going to open our service with uh, just a verse of scripture, and then I'll get, we'll pray, I'll give you the announcements, and then you won't see me again for the rest of the service. So just to open, I would like to, to read from Psalm 104 and verse 1. And it reads, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. As we gather as God's people this morning, this is why we gather. To bless the Lord. To lift up God because he is very great. And for us to acknowledge and proclaim that he is clothed with splendor and majesty. And through the Lord Jesus, now so are we. So shall we just come and bow our heads and pray together. Our awesome God, we thank you that we can come together again in this way as your people. We thank you for the privilege that it is to call ourselves sons and daughters of the Most High King of the one true and living God. And God, we come before you this morning recognizing that there is so much wrong and so much difficulty in our world. Lord, we hear of the reports of this virus throughout this world wreaking havoc. And God, we just lift our world before you and we ask, Lord, that we would see an end to this virus. We ask, Lord, for wisdom for governments around the world for medical staff around the world as they seek to deal with this pandemic, as they seek to do what is right. And Lord, we pray that in amongst the fear, in amongst the grief and in amongst the darkness that we find in this world at this time, that Lord, your name would be proclaimed in the midst of the darkness because you are the light that is like no other, that you are the light that expels all darkness. God, we ask that through this, Though times look so difficult, we ask, Lord, that we would see the beauty of Jesus radiate throughout our world. And Lord, again, we pray for our own government. We lift them before you, God, recognizing that they are fallen people like the rest of us. And Lord, we ask that you would give them wisdom as they seek to make decisions that they would like months and years to prepare for, but they have to make on the spot. We ask, Lord, that we would see this virus back under control again in our nation. That we may soon be able to find a way forward, eh, back to some form of normality. But God, we pray for rest for our leaders. Our leaders who have had exceptionally busy months. We ask, God, that you would be upon them and that somehow, through all of this, Lord, that you would reach into their hearts and you would transform lives at the highest levels in our nation. And again, Lord, we lift before you eh, all the medical staff of our nation. Lord, everybody who works in, in hospitals, in GP surgeries, in many other places, Lord, we recognize that they have had to deal with so much. And just as lots of it looked like it was coming to an end, things start back again. And Lord, we just ask, Lord, would you give them rest? Would you give them focus? Would you give them wisdom in all that we do? And Lord, we recognise in our own fellowship this morning that there are many who are ill, many who are grieving, many who are needy, many who have lost jobs or are on the brink of losing jobs. But God, we recognise that your spirit is the great comforter. And we ask, Lord, this morning that you would draw near to all your people who need to know you this morning. God, would we bring our burdens to you would we bring our struggles to you, our anxieties to you, and lay them upon the cross because Jesus is big enough to carry them and the cross of Christ deals with them. God, we thank you for the immense privilege it is that we can gather as your people. 
Be with us this morning. Speak to each of our hearts, Lord. We pray all of these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Just a few things to update you with before we hand over to our worship team. A reminder that uh, if you'd like to join us on Wednesday nights to get in contact with Bruce Bigot, uh, his details in the, uh, are in the directory. Uh, and if you would like his details, please just get in contact with one of the leadership team and we'll pass those on to you. Uh, our interim secretary, Peter Kinnan, has a new email address, which is secretary at hamiltonbaptist.org.uk. So if you have any questions with Peter, or you just want to send him fun emails, bombard that email address. Oh, I'm just joking, be nice to him. But please, if you've got any questions, uh, uh, or anything to do with the life of the church, you can uh, also use that email address. And I'm absolutely delighted to be able to, to, to bring you the plans that you hopefully received in an email from Peter at the end of this week uh, to let you know of our plans of getting back live into the church. Uh, the, the tentative plans, tentative being the key word, um, at the moment are to come back for live services starting Sunday the 8th of November, uh, Remembrance Sunday, for a live service here from the church. And that won't involve a congregation, just so we can get everything sorted and up and running. And then from the 15th of November, uh, we will open the doors and welcome back the congregation. Of course, that is limited at the moment to 50 people. We'll be using an online platform called Eventbrite, where you can book your free ticket. Uh, um, in due course, we will put out details of how you can do that. Uh, if you don't have internet access, we'll let you know how you can book tickets, and we'll get that sorted for everyone. And it was just a great thought, isn't it? That soon, even though still in small numbers, not able to sing, wearing masks, we'll still physically be able to gather in here. And, and continue to pray for everybody who's involved in setting up our live stream and our PowerPoint and our sound and getting everything sorted musically and our preachers and everybody that will gather uh, and deliver such a wonderful service on Sunday mornings. Just pray for them as we continue to prepare. And now we'll hand over to our worship team. The first song this morning is Be Thou My Vision. And this was put together uh, for the Baptist Union Assembly happening this weekend. You'll recognize Andrew and Linda amongst that, but everybody else that's part of that video, uh, part of this song, this ministry to us, are from other Baptist churches around Scotland. So please enjoy, be blessed, and take care. Thank you.
riches I need not, nor man's empty praise. Thou my inheritance now and always. Thou art the only first in my heart. I keep on. King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright and sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever before, still be my vision. Still be my vision, O ruler of
Welcome to Kids Talk. Good morning everyone. Today it's a bit grey, it's rainy and I thought what I could do is stay inside and make some cookies. It is definitely a day for baking. So what I need is a recipe. I've asked my friend Naomi to send me over her recipe for zebra cookies. And the second thing that I'm going to need to do is measure out all the ingredients. So here we have all of our ingredients measured and ready to go. So I've measured out all of my ingredients except from my eggs and in Naomi's recipe it says make sure that when you crack your eggs that you don't get any of the shell in them so you don't get any crunchy bits in your cookies. So I'll go and do that just now. No shell. <laughs> I have made a mess. <laughs> now it's time for my favourite bit, putting it all together and giving it a right good mix. Oh, look at that! Delicious. So, next thing that Naomi says to do is make your oven nice and hot, ready for your cookies to go in and bake. Now, she's also said be very, very careful when I'm putting my cookies in the oven. So I've got my oven gloves ready to go to make sure I don't get myself burned. Now I'm going to make my cookies into little balls, cover them in ice and sugar, and pop them on a tray ready to go in the oven. Here they are, ready for the oven. They are ready. And there you have it, some yummy, scrummy zebra cookies. So today we are going to talk about obedience. Now, obedience seems like a really big word, but actually what it means to obey means to follow somebody's instructions. Kind of like following a recipe. Now, some people who might give you guys instructions are maybe your parents. Maybe your parents tell you to look both ways before you cross the road. Or your teachers, maybe your teachers say to you to stop talking and to get on with your work. My teachers definitely told me to stop talking. Sometimes these instructions can feel like people are trying to spoil our fun, don't they? But actually, instructions like that are to keep us safe and to keep us learning. Just like when Naomi said to me, make sure you don't get eggshells in your cookie mix because your cookies will be crunchy and they won't taste very nice. Or make sure you wear your oven gloves when you take your cookies out of the oven because you don't want to burn yourself. Those instructions were to keep me safe. The Bible is full of lots of instructions from God to love each other, to forgive each other, to follow him, to keep our promises, to be baptised, to pray, to not be afraid and to not be jealous. Those are just some examples of the instructions that we've been given in the Bible. There's so much more. The reason that God gives us these instructions is the same as why your parents give you instructions and why your teachers give you instructions. It's because they want what is best for you and so does God. God wants your life to be full of good things. That doesn't mean our lives are going to be easy, but the Bible is full of instructions and answers to our life's problems. In 2 John, chapter 1 verse 16 it says and this is love that we might walk in obedience to his commands as you have heard from the beginning his command is that you walk in love so God keeps us safe and he shows us love through his commands and we show God love by keeping those commands I hope you enjoyed learning about obedience today guys I'm away to eat some cookies see you soon Our Bible reading this morning is Psalm 51, verses 1 to 12, where David says, Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me 
day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom, even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and make me willing to obey you. Let's pray together. Our gracious Father, we thank you for your living word. We thank you that you reveal yourself to us through your word. And we pray that as we come to consider that you are merciful, may your word touch our hearts and speak into our lives. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just draw us close to yourself. Give us minds to receive your truth and hearts that are ready to embrace you afresh in love. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I came back from my first visit to the United States in 1978 with two contrasting yet complementary images in my mind. I'd been to Jamestown in Virginia, where the first group of English settlers landed in the New World, and I saw there three replicas of the ships that carried those settlers across the ocean. They were so small and so fragile, you could hardly believe they'd be able to make that hazardous journey. The other image at the other extreme was when I was at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., and I got to walk around Skylab and saw the lunar rocks and the lunar buggies and was amazed by the technology that enabled man to walk on the moon. Both the settlers and the spacemen showed incredible courage and determination in pushing back the frontiers of knowledge and experience by journeying into the unknown. And we need that very spirit for the journey we each must take to discover the reality of the person and presence of the living God. We need courage and we need determination to explore and encounter the God who has revealed himself to us in the person of his son, Jesus. Over recent weeks, we've explored different aspects of God's character and nature. And this morning, our journey of discovery introduces us to God's mercy. Love, mercy, and grace are three distinct characteristics of God's nature that are inextricably linked together. We can't think about God's love as we did last week, without also being confronted with God's mercy channeled to us through God's grace. If love describes the way God feels about us and acts towards us, then mercy describes the way he reacts to our situation and our condition. In Psalm 103, verses 13 and 14, David says this, The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him, for he understands how weak we are. He knows we are only dust. God sees each one of us struggling to deal with the problem of sin, yearning to live in a better way with higher values, searching to find the way to God, and constantly being frustrated in that aspiration. And with a heart of love and compassion, God reaches out to us and extends his mercy to us in Jesus Christ. Mercy is always an expression of the covenant love through which God calls us into his family to be his children and reveals himself to us as our loving Heavenly Father. 
With this in mind, the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 63, 7 to 9, I will tell of the Lord's unfailing love. I will praise the Lord for all he has done. I will rejoice in his great goodness to Israel, which he has granted according to his mercy and love. He said, they are my very own people. Surely they will not be false again. And he became their savior. In all their sufferings, he also suffered. And he personally rescued them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them through all the years. Reading that verse, I was just thinking, how amazing it is if we are able to say this morning that we can personalize Isaiah's testimony. He became my savior. How amazing to think that God has become our savior. In all my sufferings, he also suffered. And he personally rescued me. And in his love and mercy, he redeemed me. He lifted me up and carried me through all the years. I hope you can make that your own testimony, these wonderful words of Isaiah. Uh, the 19th century American preacher Thomas DeWitt Talmadge said this, I am told that the wonderful mercy of God is like an ocean on which are placed four swift sailing craft, each with compass, sextant, choice rigging, and a skillful navigator. I tell them to launch away and discover for me the extent of this uncharted sea. The first ship sails to the north, the second to the south, the third to the east, and the fourth to the west. They sail 10,000 years and one day come up to the harbor of heaven. I shout to them from the beach, have you found the shore? And they answer, there is no shore to God's mercy. Swift angels dispatched from the throne attempt to go across it. For a million years they fly and fly, but then come back and bow their heads at the foot of the throne and cry, no shore, no shore to God's mercy. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, there is no limit to the mercy of God. And as we think about that ocean of God's mercy, God invites you and me this morning to plunge into its depths and to rejoice in the wonder of it. As we turn to the Scriptures, the Scripture shows us, first of all, that mercy is God's sacred personality. God revealed himself to Moses on Mount Sinai as a, a God of mercy. In Exodus 34, verse 6, I am the Lord, I am the Lord, the merciful and gracious God. I'm slow to anger and rich in unfailing love and faithfulness. I show this unfailing love to many thousands by forgiving every kind of sin and rebellion. Even so, I do not leave sin unpunished. God's mercy is expressed as much in his justice as in his love and compassion. Mercy would be a cheap commodity if it were offered at the expense of his righteousness and holiness. But God's attributes do not conflict with each other, rather they complement each other. And we see the reality of God's mercy through his continuing faithfulness to those who are in a covenant relationship with him, even when they are so often unfaithful. Moses says in Deuteronomy 4 and 31, for the Lord your God is merciful. He will not abandon you or destroy you or forget the covenant. God cannot ever deny himself or ever be less than perfect. He shows mercy to man because mercy is a fundamental aspect of his nature and very being. Even when the Jews turned their back on God, God still reached out to them in love and mercy. Jeremiah 3.12, O Israel, my faithless people, come home to me again, 
for I am merciful. I will not be angry with you forever. Only acknowledge your guilt. Because God is merciful, he's not willing to give up on anyone. He keeps the door of salvation open so that anyone today who confesses and repents of their sins may enter into eternal life. 1 Peter 1.3 says, All honor to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for it is by his boundless mercy that God has given us the privilege of being born again. Now we live with a wonderful expectation because Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. For God has reserved a priceless inheritance for his children. It's kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. Mercy is fundamental to God's personality. God will never be anything other than merciful. Mercy is God's sacred personality, but secondly, mercy is also God's sovereign prerogative. On his deathbed, the German poet and philosopher Heinrich Heine, a friend of Marx and Engels, but a Jewish convert to Christianity, is said to have declared, of course God will forgive me. That's his job. And in some ways, there is truth in what Heine said. And yet that statement on its own fails to express the fullness of truth. You see, man has no claim of rights on the mercy of God. We cannot presume on God's mercy. It's entirely his prerogative to exercise mercy. In Exodus 33, 19, God says, I will show mercy to anyone I choose. And quoting that very verse in Romans 9, 16, Paul expounds it by saying, so receiving God's promise is not up to us. We can't get it by choosing it or working hard for it. God will show mercy to anyone he chooses. Now, some people might think it's not fair of God to be merciful to some and not to others. Paul, in Romans 9, 19, explores that question. Well then, you might say, why does God blame people for not listening? Haven't they simply done what he made them to do? No, don't say that. Who are you, a mere human being, to criticize God? Should the thing that was created say to the one who made it, Why have you made me like this? When a potter makes jars out of clay, doesn't he have the right to use the same lump of clay to make one jar for decoration and another to throw garbage into? It's wrong to ever think that God would do anything that was less than scrupulously righteous and fair. God will never be anything other than merciful, even in judgment. In his book, Discover Yourself in the Psalms, Warren Wearsby tells a story from the American uh, West. In a frontier town, a horse bolted and ran away with a wagon that had a little child in it. Seeing that the child was in danger, a young man risked his life to catch the horse and stop it. The child who was rescued on that day grew up to become a lawless man. And one day he stood before a judge to be sentenced for a serious crime. The prisoner recognized the judge was the man who years before had saved his life. So he pleaded for mercy on the basis of that experience of already having been saved by him. But the words from the bench silenced all his pleas. Young man, then I was your savior. Today, I am your judge, and I must sentence you to be hanged. Today, through the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, God in mercy reaches out to us as our Savior. But if we turn our back on God as our Savior, then one day we will stand before him as our judge. 
When we make our appeal to God for mercy, it has to be on his terms, not ours. We have to acknowledge and repent of our sins. Proverbs 28, 13 says, People who cover over their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and forsake them, they will receive mercy. And on that basis, David prayed in Psalm 51, verses 1 to 3 in our reading this morning, Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, Blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my shameful deeds. They haunt me day and night. It is always God's prerogative to be merciful. We have no right to expect mercy. But when we receive it, we are forever in God's debt. Mercy is God's saving, sacred personality. Mercy is God's sovereign prerogative. And mercy, thirdly, is God's saving purpose. While God must always be true to his righteousness and justice, his desire, his heart's passion, is to be a merciful saviour. God saw man's helplessness in the face of his sin, and he had compassion on him. Out of that desire to show mercy, he established a covenant with man, opening up the way to salvation. The Bible tells us the only way we can be forgiven our sins and reconciled to this holy God is through that way of salvation, which meets the demands of his justice, his holiness. Psalm 89 verse 14 says, Your throne is founded on two strong pillars, righteousness and justice. Unfailing love and truth walk before you. So under the old covenant, God opened up a way of salvation that satisfied his justice. Man's sin was atoned through the sacrifice of a substitute, the Passover lamb. On the Day of Atonement, the Lamb was slain, and the high priest would take its blood into the most holy place in the temple and sprinkle that blood over the mercy seat. The mercy seat was God's symbolic throne on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And when the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat, God's justice was fully satisfied. His mercy was extended to guilty sinners. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ is the spiritual fulfillment of everything we see portrayed in the mercy seat, the lamb of sacrifice, and the atoning blood. Paul says in Romans 3, 23 to 26, All have sinned. All fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet now God in his gracious kindness declares us not guilty. He's done this through Christ Jesus who has freed us by taking away our sin. For God sent Jesus to take the punishment for our sins and to satisfy God's anger against us. We are made right with God when we believe that Jesus shed his blood sacrificing his life for us. God was being entirely fair and just when he did not punish those who sinned in former times. And he is entirely fair and just in this present time when he declares sinners to be right in his sight because they believe in Jesus. It has always been God's purpose to save lost sinners and bring them back to himself. On the cross, the Lord Jesus, our Passover lamb of sacrifice, offered himself as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. The cross is the demonstration of God's mercy reaching out to sinners. At the cross, God's justice was satisfied, sin's penalty was paid, and God's wrath averted from sinners who deserved his punishment. Titus 3, 4 and 5 reminds us, Then God our Savior showed us his kindness and love. He saved us, not because of the good things we did, 
but because of his mercy. David wasn't content simply to be forgiven. David wanted to be made clean and pure, so he cries out to God in verse 7 of Psalm 51, Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. God's purpose has always been to show mercy to guilty sinners. Paul says in Ephesians 2.4, God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so very much that even while we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's special favor that you have been saved. Mercy is God's saving purpose. And then the scriptures also teach us that mercy is God's supreme pleasure. God says in Ezekiel 18 and 23, Do you think that I like to see wicked people die? Of course not. I only want them to turn from their wicked ways and live. God takes no pleasure in punishing the wicked. Rather, he delights to show mercy. Micah 7 and 18 says, Where is another God like you who pardons the sins of his people? You cannot stay angry with your people forever because you delight in showing mercy. So when we ask for mercy, we are asking for the gift that God delights to give to us. Nothing pleases God more than to hear someone pray the prayer of David in Psalm 51, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me again the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Those today who pray David's prayer for a clean heart, for a right spirit, to be restored and made new in God's presence, to have a willing, obedient spirit, those who pray that prayer bring great joy to the heart of God. The joy that is in heaven when the lost sheep is found and restored again to the fold. So, mercy is God's sacred personality. It is God's sovereign prerogative. It's God's saving purpose. And it's God's supreme pleasure. And finally, mercy is also man's special privilege. It's our privilege to receive God's mercy is something we don't deserve and something we should never take for granted. When the old Puritan saint Richard Hooker was dying, his friends around the bedside said, Brother Hooker, you are going to receive your reward shortly. No, no, he replied. I go to receive mercy. All you and I deserve is punishment and condemnation because of our sin. But because of God's grace, we have received mercy. And it's our privilege to receive that mercy he offers to us in Jesus Christ this morning. And if it's our privilege to receive mercy, then it's finally our privilege also to extend that mercy to others. It's our privilege to receive and our privilege to give. God says in Hosea 6, 6, I want you to be merciful. I don't want your sacrifices. And in Micah 6, 8, those memorable words, the Lord has already told you what is good, and this is what he requires, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. In the parable he told about the unforgiving servant, Jesus warns us 
that God will only show mercy to those who themselves will be merciful. Matthew 5, 7, in the Beatitudes, God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And in James 2, 13, there will be no mercy for you if you have not been merciful to others. If we want God to be merciful to us, then we must be merciful in turn to others. It's the special privilege of man to be the object of God's rich mercy. Every one of us is a debtor to God's mercy and grace. Mercy is one of those amazing attributes of our God. So alien in man, but so intrinsic and fundamental to God. Mercy is God's sacred personality. It is who he is. Mercy is God's sovereign prerogative. It's the decision he wants to make. Mercy is God's saving purpose. He longs for all to be saved. And it's God's supreme pleasure. And that's why mercy is our special privilege this morning. Let's rejoice that our God is a God who is merciful. Let us pray. Father, how we thank you for your mercy, a mercy that is lavished upon us through Jesus Christ, your Son. Help us each one this morning to be able to receive that mercy and to share it with others. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Sets us free means death. 